Welcome to another episode of Hutch on Hunting. This is Bruce Hutchin, and with me tonight is Mr. Dan Gates. Dan has done just about everything, sat on every single conservation board in the state of Colorado. I got his bio with his resume, and I went, I said, Dan, you should run for Congress or representative in the state. I mean, you know more what's happening in the state than probably the people at the courthouse or the Capitol. Dan, welcome to the show. And, and why don't you just introduce yourself and tell the listeners throughout the country and in Canada why you're doing what you're doing for Save the Hunt in Colorado. So thanks a bunch, Bruce. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Dan Gates. I'm the current executive director for the Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife Management. Uh, currently, I'm also, and have been for the last 12 years, the president for the Colorado Trappers and Predator Hunters Association. I'm the vice chair for the Colorado Wildlife Conservation Project, which is a, a coalition of about 30 different organizations that are national, regional, and state organizations, all the big acronym groups that you could name. And uh, as you said, I've, I've sat on a bunch of different years some of that appointed some of it senate confirmed appointed by the governors uh, none of which i would say that i voted for and and i I'm, I'm proud to say that i was good enough to be selected but but uh i didn't drink the kool-aid and uh and so i'm i'm hoping that my involvement at this landscape not so much provides a legacy but it provides a conduit and a mechanism to where sportsmen and women can continue to do what they do as far as participate in the North American model of wildlife conservation and science-based wildlife management. And the first organization that I mentioned, which we use the acronym CRWM, the mission of that is to enhance, promote, and defend the North American model of wildlife conservation and responsible wildlife management. So uh, we are a 501 C4. Just define what the North American model is, because some people they talk about it, and they really don't know what they're talking about. So so the model itself is seven tenants that were established by two specific individuals. Uh, the model is not 125 years old in a sense. It, I mean, the model was written uh, by Valerius Geist, John Organ, and Shane Mahoney. And it was written on the on the successes that have been created over the last 125 years. Shane Mahoney is probably around 70 John Organ's pushed in that, that age. Valerius Geist died in 2021. Uh, and, and the three of those took what the stewards of conservation back in the early 1900s, the late 1800s and early 1900s, set in stone about today's environment of what we have. They thought they were foresightful and thought about what needed to be done. So you had the Roosevelt's and the Hornaday's and the Audubon's and the, and the Boone's and Crockett's and the Pope's and Young's and, and the Pinchot's and the Giffard's. Those guys set the tone and the narrative for where we are at today. It's just that with the North American model, the writing of the model itself, it was codified. It actually became a document. It became something to establish in the context of how do we establish what we have and sustain it in perpetuity as opposed to just ride on the coattails of our forefathers and stewards of conservation and wildlife resources. And Mahoney and Oregon and Valerius Geis did that impeccably however as with with any document any book any study somebody's going to uh, try to change it they disagree with it and that's what we're dealing with now is the ideology that the model is is no longer a a, a model that should be used without a adaptation and without changing it to our particular wants or wishes or desires depending on what group that might be the interesting thing about that is the people that are fighting to take and alter the model that we stand so hard behind, they think it was actually created 125 years ago. The concept of it was, but the model itself, where it was written in stone, was not 125 years ago. That model of the seven tenets that we adhere to, somewhat like the Bill of Rights or the Ten Commandments, is what science-based wildlife management has done over the course of the last 125 years on natural resource management, on wildlife management, and given the authority of game agencies to utilize the wildlife as a public trust component 
that they, they do things for the benefit of the people, all people, not just hunters and anglers, all people, and the wildlife and the natural resources and the, and the states that govern that, and the Canadian provinces as well. So when you think about that, there's a big parallel to what's happening to our constitution in the United States and people that have, for whatever reason, their own narrative, their own belief that what stood the test of time, which provided an increase of wildlife, the United States, ducks, geese, elk, and you can go back, white-tailed deer, turkeys, they've been brought back to present day because of people like you and I, hunters and fishermen, Congress funded, established the Pitt and Robinson that sends money back to states on what hunters and fishermen spend. So we've actually supported this. Now, all of a sudden, mirroring what's happening in Washington, D.C., people don't want this way of life or this model to exist. And that's exactly. what we're fighting in Colorado right now with the lion, bobcat, and lynx ban that's going to be put up on the docket, the election in November, on the November 5th, if it somehow doesn't make it. Now, you got to clarify for me and my listeners exactly how 101 became 91, those propositions, 101 propositions, 91. So just kind of flesh that out if you can in the next few minutes so people understand what we're fighting. And what Save the Hunt in Colorado.com is all about. Yeah, Save the Hunt Colorado.com. We don't want to put, put in in there because they'll, they'll end up going. Save the Hunt else. Colorado. Yeah. Uh, but I'll give you a little bit of historical context that, that will bring us up to current day. And in 2019, uh, there was a group, the Humane Society of the United States, along with a bunch of their counterparts, filed a citizen's petition with the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission to ban the harvest of bobcats, which we successfully de defeated with this governor's, Governor Polis's commission. And we were told that we would have a tough fight ahead of us, but we did come out victorious 11 to zero. They didn't like that result. So during COVID in 2020, they came back again and ran another citizen's petition, which we then defeated 11 to zero with the governor's commission. They came back in 2021 and tried it again and found out that they probably wouldn't have a favorable outcome and they didn't want to do the three strikes you're out deal. So they withdrew the petition before it was actually heard by the commission, but they were full steam ahead until the point that they said, well, you know, three strikes you're out isn't a good look. So we'll withdraw it. In 2022, they decided to go back to the well only differently and go to the Colorado legislature and run Senate Bill 31, which then they upped their game thinking that they had full and unequivocal support from the Colorado General Assembly. And so they ran a bill to stop the harvest of bobcats and mountain lions. So they upped their game. Well, we were told that we would be losers on that end, and we won that in a Democratic legislature through the Senate Ag Committee. We won that four to, four to one. A lot of those co-sponsors of that bill actually bailed because of the support that we were getting and the outcry that they were receiving from the sportsmen and women and the conservation-minded individuals in the state of Colorado. So it brings us up to current day in, in September of 23, where after losing on three different occasions and withdrawing one petition, they opted to go to a ballot initiative. And it's, it's, it's meaningful to distinguish the difference between the three because the people that aren't playing on this landscape, because this is not the most important landscape to a lot of people, but it is to us, and they need to know the steps in the process. So anybody can run a citizen's petition to a commission. Anybody can run a piece of legislation if they can get a legislature to, legislator to do that through a bill. This is a ballot initiative that we're dealing with now. And this is a ballot initiative to where 
if the signatures are gathered, they will be able to run a ballot for the general public to vote on come this November. Now, when they started this process back in 23, on September 22nd of 23, we were a, a, appropriately positioned to automatically appeal and claim foul on this particular initiative, which was initiative 91. Now I've gone through this many, many times and I don't want to be redundant to anybody, but to cut to the chase, we had the funds, we had the wherewithal. And I say, we, the Coloradans for responsible wildlife management, because we are a 501 C4. We are not a C3 like all the other acronym groups in the state of Colorado. We're the only organization that has full-time lobbying representation at the Colorado state Capitol for sportsmen and women and conservation issues. Other groups, they might go fight on an, an, a singular issue that pertains to their organization, but they don't have full-time lobby representation. So because of what we were structured back in 2017, we could pull the trigger and say, we want to appeal this, we want to fight this, which we did. And we went through the Legislative Council, the Secretary of State, the rehearings through the sec Secretary of State Title Board, and then subsequently, upon getting language changed on 91, the first one, then we went to the Supreme Court to get some other language change or some clarification or some single subject matters that were not, in our opinion, uh, appropriately addressed. As we went through that process, the proponents decided to throw another initiative at the wall to see if that might be better and stick better. So that was the initiative 101. So the 91 was going to the Supreme Court, even though the language was a little bit more favorable to us because we got trophy hunting out of the title. We can't say anything about the four-page measure. We can't say what is in the content of the measure. We can only address the title, hence called the title board. As we're fighting through that and got it to that stage, 101 came up and we had to do the same process with 101 as what we did on 91. Had to go through the title board, the rehearings, and then eventually the Supreme Court. As that went through the Supreme Court in our first challenge at the rehearing to go through the Supreme Court, that was on January 3rd, we, we got some language changed in it. It was not as favorable to us, but it was more favorable to the opponents because of the language and where we could take trophy hunting and move it in one sentence and put it down to another. And they were allowing some, some fallacies of a season that they said, oh, we're not banning hunting. It's not a trophy ban. They were going to allow a two-week season, although you couldn't keep the head, the hide, any of the claws. You only could keep the meat, and everything else had to be turned over to the division at the time. And that season was actually for the last two weeks of December. And you couldn't use hounds, and you couldn't use electronic collar uh, tracking devices. Uh, and, and so when we got our confirmation on 101 that it was changed to some degree, but not into our favor, the day after that, the Supreme Court affirmed the title on the first initiative, 91. So that was set on a shelf to where the, the proponents could use that if they so chose. But 101 was more favorable. Now, if you listen to any of the blogs and the websites and stuff that the proponents have, they didn't like the idea that we were trying to delay and we were using a tactic of kicking it down the road as far as what we possibly could because we wanted to challenge everything that we could and leave no stone unturned. Now, I want to throw in there, Bruce, that that costs money. When you have the best attorneys to be able to do that and you have the best counsel to be able to do that, that is not something where you just say, I'm going to do it because we got garage sale money. That's a hell of a lot more than garage sale money. It's not a lemonade stand. As we move forward through the month of January on 101, the proponents became a little bit more wary that if they went through that process through the Supreme Court on 101, they would probably likely run out of time to be able to gather signatures in the timely manner that they are allowed before the deadline would be cut off on August 5th. So when we were supposed to file our first briefs on 101 on January 30th in preparation for January 31st, we were notified that they were withdrawing 101 that was going to the Supreme Court and they were going to immediately pick up where they left off on 91 because it had already been affirmed, even though it was sitting on the shelf and they wanted to get the paperwork and documentation in line to where they could start gathering signatures on 91. The cutoff date for them to gather signatures because the time, the time clock started ticking on January 4th when the title was affirmed. So in essence, they have until 
July 4th to be able to get the 125,000 or so signatures that they need, even though we think that they'll probably need somewhere between 170 and 190,000 because you're going to have some that aren't certifiable that you can't actually read, you know, whatever they are. So 101 was kicked to the curb. So everybody that's listening to your podcast and everybody that's trying to convey messages and, and so forth, we won't be confusing the crap out of them anymore about 91 and 101 and Supreme Court and title board and rehearing and no rehearing. We are dealing with initiative 91, and that's what they're starting to gather signatures on. But I want to preface that statement that people need to start talking about the hunting ban in the state of Colorado. Do not talk about just initiative 91, because that will not be the final initiative when it gets on the ballot, if they get enough signatures, those things will be recategorized and renumerated depending on how the ballots actually come back with initiative numbers to be on the ballot for people to vote on come October and November. So it might be initiative 107 or 131. What we, what we don't want is our audience to be set on 91 and find out 90 wasn't a, one isn't on there or 91 doesn't even have to do with hunting ban. It's, you know, for rusty tires, rusty hubcaps on a car or an abortion bill or, or legislation or something. They need to be cognizant. Our audience needs to be cognizant. We are dealing with 91 now, but it is still a proposed initiative to be on the ballot. But if they get the signatures, then they get them affirmed and everything's done in accordance with Colorado law and statute by July 4th, it'll be on the ballot for our voters in the state of Colorado to vote on starting October 5th when the mail-in ballots are sent out, November 5th when the in-person ballots are, are taken, and it might be any one of those other numbers that I mentioned or another number completely. So that's that's a historical background perspective going back to 2019 of how we are at where we are today. Okay, folks. One, we need money. Dan, <laughs> Yeah. how do they send you money? Well... We have a website set up. Uh, it's the Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife Management. But the but the the easy login is save the hunt, Colorado dot com. Uh, What's that again? Save the hunt, Colorado dot com. And th all of that money has and will go to fight this and and other initiatives if they pop up. We did on January twenty fourth formulate our issues committee. Now, I don't want to confuse anybody that's listening to this stuff and go, my head is spinning and I need to shut this off and go get a drink. But the issues committee is something that has to be done if you are going to appropriately counter or promote a ballot initiative in the state of Colorado. So the issues committee is, is more highly regulated than what Save the Hunt or CRWM is because it's a campaign. CRWM was Save the Hunt is in support of advocacy and education for stopping the ballot initiative. But for stopping the ballot initiative comes in many, many different forms and shapes. The issues committee that we formulated is Colorado wildlife deserve better because we think it does. That is still a 501c4. So if anybody contributes to SaveTheHuntColorado.com, which we would prefer to have them do, for one, it's easier and it's a little bit more transparent, or if they decide eventually to contribute to Colorado Wildlife Deserve Better, both of those things are going to the same cause. They're going to the same effort for the same reason and so if you look at anything that's been kicked out over the course of, I guess, it's probably the historical side of things, people have seen all sorts of things come to ballot measures. And they see they say at the bottom, paid for by such and such. If you see something come out to defeat this measure, whether it's a campaign ad or a network television ad or whatever, it will say at the bottom, paid for by Colorado Wildlife Deserve Better. It won't say paid for by the Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife Management. It won't say the website, savethehuntcolorado.com. The reason being is because there's campaign finance regulations and laws that have to be adhered to, not only in this state and other states, 
But we are a 501c4 organization, and the other component we're talking about is an issues committee. Both will do the same thing for the same reason, but one is fighting the campaign. The other one, CRWM, is doing education and advocacy to stop hunting bans in the state of Colorado. Hope that explains it. Thank you. So we look at the, as you say, the landscape, I like that word. Look at the landscape. Why do you think 500,000 people, and that's fishing licenses and hunting licenses in Colorado, when all join together and say, no, hell no, I want to fish and hunt. I want my grandkids to fish and hunt. Because the way the narrative is going, within 10 years, because of predation, our elk herd of 250,000 is going to be down half of that. I'm just using, extrapolating what's happened in Idaho and Montana and Wyoming. Because once we would let lions run free, bobcats run free, we already know what happened to the um, black bears. We don't have a spring season anymore. So we got all these plus wolves. We all have all these apex predators running free. So what happens to all the hunting licenses revenue? What happens to out-of-state hunters? Because, folks, this isn't just a Colorado problem. If you have ever hunted in Colorado, you got skin in the game. Or if you wanted to hunt. Or if you plan on hunt. Yeah, because, and I'm telling everybody on my blogs and on my uh, social media posts burn their points because I have no idea. We have in May the new five-year season coming up mm -hmm. that the commission is going to decide upon. We have no idea what the seasons are going to be, what they're going to look like. Right. Unless you're on the commission. So if you're sitting in Pennsylvania and you guys have been to Colorado five times, one time or zero times and are planning, this concerns you. So that's why you should put five bucks in the, in the mail, 10 bucks, whatever, save the hunt Colorado and invest in your future, not ours. Dan and I just happen to live here and care about our state, care about the species. I care about the North American model because if that goes away, folks, you're not going to have hunting in Colorado. Not only are you not going to have hunting, Bruce, um, the way that they've structured the language and the measure, and people can go to savethehuntcolorado.com and look at the language of the measure. It's under Initiative 91. It's easier to find there than it is the Secretary of State's office, even though the Secretary of State's office is fairly easy if you know how to navigate that that government, you know, internet landscape. Um, but the language in the measure, not the title, not the title that people are going to see on the ballot, the language in the measure that they would see in the blue book that would support the ballot. The language specifically says that the definition of trophy hunting, which they call this a trophy hunting initiative, even though we got trophy hunting out of the title on Initiative 91, they call it trophy hunting. It's a trophy hunting ban. The definition of trophy hunting means to intentionally kill, pursue, wound, stalk, or entrap a mountain lion, bobcat, or a lynx. And it needs to be specified for the people that haven't heard me talk about this for the last four months. Lynx cannot be harvested in the lower 48 because they are federally protected and state protected. They can be harvested in Canada and in Alaska. Right. And go, I have never seen a lynx. I've seen several down in the Southwest. I've seen a couple in Montana. Um, yeah, but not in Colorado. I've never oh, yeah. seen a track. No, well, you might not have seen it, but but we, we when we introduced links back in the in the mid nineties, uh, reintroduced links 
uh, actually the Colorado Trappers and Predator Hunters Association, which was the Colorado Trappers Association at the, to- at the time, helped helped be able to turn around and do that, just like we did on river otter, just like we did on other species and other other things that on the landscape that we have to deal with. Uh, but the wording in that measure intentionally kill, pursue, stalk, wound, or entrap. That's hunting. It's not trophy hunting. And we've said this many, many, many times. You take mountain lion, bobcat, and lynx, just because it's the red herring and it's in the language, but you take mountain lion and bobcat out and put elk, sheep, coyotes, doesn't matter. turkeys, it doesn't matter. What it does is it sets a precedent, Bruce, for statutory language that can then be used not only in this state, but other states, because it's not set in stone anywhere in the United States. Trophy hunting is not is not in any statutory language that we can find in any game management agency throughout the country. But as soon as one state, which you know here, everybody, every, everybody in this gubernatorial administration wants to be the first at everything here, you establish trophy hunting as the definition where it actually means hunting, you can put any other species in there and they can turn around and capitalize on the momentum and the success that they get if they actually won. Point, point in case, Tris Zornio with the Colorado Sun last summer did an article specifically say, stating in the article, why are bighorn sheep any different than mountain lions? That was before this initiative was filed in late September because they were already planning their attack. They're setting the tone. They're setting the narrative. They're laying peop- letting people know. They're letting us know that it's not about mountain lions and bobcats. And they're letting the other people know that why is there any difference between any of it? Because they're already setting that tone and narrative. People better pay damn close attention to the way interpretation is and statutory language. Because whether you hunt a mountain lion or a bobcat, it doesn't matter. They want what you have. If you read other measures in the, the language in the measure, where it talks about You can't use electronic tracking devices on your dogs. If you listen to what they've said in tidal board hearings, they reference and they talk about pheasant dogs, coon dogs, waterfowl dogs, beagles. They don't want you using anything because it's in the measure. Now, it might only pertain to mountain lions and bobcats and lynx at this time, but you can't tell me that the next time when they get rid of this, that they're not going after the other guys, whether it's the dog, whether it's the, the collar, whether it's the species, whether it's the method of take, it doesn't matter. And anybody that thinks that this is just a one-off on bobcats and mountain lions needs to look at the language in the initiative and see what it says. Because what we need to do is educate our rank and file, our hook and bullet guys, and make sure our community fully understands that this is the first step, the way it's read, the way it's written, the way the language is, it's the first step that they can capitalize on everything that we've been bitching and complaining about, what we've been profiting and prophesying about over the course of the last 20 years. It is in this measure, and people better wake up and smell the roses. Two thoughts. I'll go to the first one. Success was had when reintroduction of wolves happen by ballot in Colorado. And that opened the floodgates, in my opinion, this man's opinion, to people who had no knowledge of the North American model of how important the DNR is using science to manage wildlife period. But the rank and file, the people along the front range, they said, oh, that's a pretty thing. I, I, sure, I'll, I'll vote for reintroduction. That'd be nice to see in the park or in the wilderness when I'm out jogging with my dog. And to me, that was, that was the Trojan horse. As soon as that happened, 
people who want to destroy what I hold dear. And I've been hunting since 1966. For a lot of reasons. One of them is field to play. Two is community. Three is tradition. I'm a hunter. You mentioned Steve Ranella, me dinner. You know, he's a hunter. Done very well with the show, but he's still a hunter. There's 13.8 million hunters in the United States of America. And just like the other aspects to our country right now, we've been marginalized and Colorado is ground zero folks. The Trojan horse is at the Capitol. And if the people in the front range decide to take over the management of wildlife in Colorado with this ballot initiative in November, if it gets that far, then everything you think you know about wildlife or care about wildlife has been destroyed. Yeah, and, and I think um, people need to recognize that the bad guy here is not our game management agency. The bad not guy here is not, not Colorado Parks and Wildlife. The bad guy here is not your local game warden. The bad guy here is an agenda-driven gubernatorial administration that has an animal rights husband, spouse First general. of the governor that has significant contacts on the landscape and has a favorable rating amongst extremist groups that are all against the things that we've been fighting for in the in, in the state of Colorado for the course of the last 25 plus years. I would like to mention too that some of those individuals have moved here from out of state to do these specific tasks. They were hired for these specific reasons. They came here with these specific orders and instructions. And people in Colorado need to recognize, not just the sportsmen and women, but people in Colorado need to recognize that our wildlife resources, our natural resources, are not here for the taking of agenda-driven mentalities to stop a science-based management agency that has been doing what it's been doing for the last 125 years to try to sustain in perpetuity our game species, 78 game species, 961 species of total wildlife. That's been their task, their mission, and they have done such a formidable job, whether you argue with a season or an allocation, or point restrictions, or I didn't get a tag, and I got too many preference points, and that guy didn't have enough. Whatever the argument might be, it's not the managing agency. They are not the enemy on this. We want them to be the experts that drive the science. Whether we agree with it or not 100%, or do you want the animal extremists who move from out of state to come in state to utilize the resources that have been laid out for them like a golden brick road by individuals in this administration and this cabinet. Do you want them setting the tone and the narrative of what we do with our wildlife resources for your kids and your grandkids, or maybe their kids and grandkids? Because this is the epicenter, like you said. This is the starting point. And if they can accomplish what they can hear what they want to accomplish by changing statutory language. It sets the, the entire nucleus of what everything is happening in the Western United States. It turns it on its axis and they can easily manipulate it and move to the next level, whether it's here or New Mexico or Arizona or Wyoming or Idaho or wherever the hell they want to go. We have to figure out a way collectively and I, would, I wish I could 
I get expressed no more enthusiasm and, and optimism than what I've got, but I wish I could express to the general listener of the army that is being built behind the scenes that people have not seen so far. And you talk about a Trojan horse, Bruce. You watch what we do come July, August, and September. You watch what we've created. You watch the national influence, the industry, the donations and contributions go to work. We've taken donations in from 49 states so far. The sporting community and industry is stepping up like never before in the Western United States. And I'm talking the major sales divisions, the major manufacturers, the major influencers, the major organizations, they are kicking in not only monetarily, but marketing wise, they're kicking in strategic plans. They're kicking in things like what you're doing on this level, on such a level of magnificent proportions that you want to see something remarkable happen. Wait until we unleash the Trojan horse. And these, these individual groups will will not want to come back to Colorado. When we get done with them, they will not want to turn around and do what we have done and what we've accomplished and what we built on. I promise you that. And they won't want to go to the next state that we hand our playbook and our roadmap to and say, this is what we did and this is how we did it. And, oh, we built this coalition. We built this unified, organized alliance nationwide in Colorado because everybody came to us and now we want to turn around and be able to unleash that to every other state that has the same problem that we do because we became an army and we became an effort of unity. And the animal rights activists are going to say, oh, maybe we need to go to New Hampshire or talk about turkeys. Or maybe we turn around and need to go to Michigan and talk about white-tailed deer. But we don't want to screw with the West anymore because those guys have come out of the woodwork and they awoke a sleeping giant. And folks, if you if you read history, what happened in Colorado, there was a playbook, and Dan just mentioned the word playbook and trade. Yep. There's a playbook that was written here in Colorado how to take over a red state and make it blue. But because we're passionate. We have direction and we believe that in such a time as this, that Colorado will be the instrument that will help turn the tide on one small part of the narrative that's being jammed down my throat, Dan's throat, and your throat, because I'm tired of it. I was talking to Cal Reeves on the phone, and he's a very vocal proponent about the southern border holding the red, I mean, the blue line. And people are rising up in this country, and Mr. Gann Gates is one of those people that has risen up and said, no, I'm going to fight right here in my state of Colorado for the things that I hold dear. And if you can hear my voice, this makes sense. Help Dan out. Help yourself out by funding SaveTheHuntColorado.com. Bruce, you mentioned the book. You mentioned the playbook. I'm going to see if I can't show it on here. Yeah, there you go. I just, yeah, uh -huh. I had a brain yeah. fart. I, the blueprint. Yeah, the, there it the is, blueprint. That, Tell, that, them, tell, that, them, tell that the is, listeners the name of it. That's It's called The Blueprint, How, How the Democrats Won Colorado and Why Republicans Everywhere Should Care. It was done by Adam Schrager and Rob Whitwer. I would encourage anybody who has concerns about the degradation and erosion of their landscape and what they believe in whether it has to do with wildlife conservation or not, this is not a prophecy. This is a recollection of fact and what Those they actually facts. did here. Those are facts. That's actually facts. I'm, I play at the Capitol in the legislature, and like I said, we've got a lobbyist and have for the last six years. She's mentioned in here 
because she was a state representative at the time. And she's running for the House District 58 again this time. She's going to leave us if she's elected because she's sick and tired of what is happening at the Capitol. And she wants to go back to the state house to try to help change things. Another book I want to make sure people are aware of is, and it's hard to see because it's backwards, I think, but the North American oh, it's, model. It's good. Of wild, it's good. Oh, good. North American model of wildlife conservation. It's a hardbound book. It's done by Shane, Shane Mahoney and Valerius Geist. You should get and if online. you haven't read it, folks, you need to read that. To this, is, understand this is the Bible. What Dan and I have been talking about. I've been at this game, been involved in conservation on many different levels for a long time. And that is worth fighting for if you're a sportsman. It's not only worth fighting for. It's worth living for. It's worth existing for. When you go out and hunt and you fish and you buy the license and you are part of the process of the North American model ideology and mentality, you are completing the tasks that our forefathers set from the Roosevelt's and the Pinchot's and the Giffards. They did that. So we would have that. So we would have what we have now sustainable wildlife management, sustainable wildlife populations in perpetuity. They did that because they saw what happened with no regulation. People need to reflect about what it was 140 or 160 years ago. It's not so much that the hunters went out and did it because it wasn't an avocation. It wasn't a recreation. It was a subsistence deal. They were market hunters. Because they were supplying for the human population and Western expansion. So they killed everything that they could possibly think about eating. And they did it in such vast numbers that the sportsmen, the legitimate sportsmen and women that were in existence at that point in time, the conservation-minded guys that were looking at national parks and historical components of, of what we have today, they foresaw what we have today because they saw things be depleted and extirpated and become extinct. The passenger pigeon, for, for instance, they killed them by the, the tens and tens of millions. They didn't do it for fun. They did it for food. Buffalo, elk, deer, bighorn sheep, you name it. We have what we have today because of what they sacrificed for and then entrusting the government agencies through proper legislation. If you look at the Lacey Act, you look at the Migratory Bird Act. You mentioned Pittman Robertson, 1937, Dingle Johnson in 1953. You can even get into the Endangered Species Act. While that needs to be modified to some degree, depending on what it is and who you look at, it's a sportsman-related wildlife conservation component that has been instilled in our blood in this country over the course of the last 125 to 140 years. It's our job to maintain that. We should not just roll over and let people take it away from us. We should not let them try to uh, tell us how to adapt to it. They need to allow the adaptation of that model, of that historical and traditional heritage, be based upon science. They are part, they are part of the public resource. They are part of the public trust, the public trust doctrine that is in the North American model of wildlife conservation. They want to profess that that is something that we shouldn't believe in, but they want it for themselves, but we can't utilize it. There's something there when the hypocrisy gets to a point to where it's absolute lunacy that I don't want you to do what you do, but I want to be able to turn around and, and reap the benefits. I want to sow the oats of what you can't do because I think that you shouldn't be able to do it. I think that's absolute bullshit. I think that we need to turn around and put our foot down collectively, individually, organizationally, industry-wise, landowner-wise, government-wise, and say enough is enough. And if we don't do that now, and if we don't stop stupid crap like this this November, when are we going to do it, Bruce? I don't you know. Are you going to do it the next time? There might not be a next time. That's my point. And one thing I want to say, folks, do you know where Bone China came from? how Bone China was created because affluent people 
wanted something, wanted the China not to fall apart. So they took bone. Where do you think that bone came from? Mm -hmm. Skulls of buffalo. And in the Western expansion, there would be piles. No, there would be mounds. No, there would be hills of skulls of buffalo that were killed. Not only for the hide, but then they had the skulls and it became bone china. So man left to himself turns to greed, turns to evil, and I'll just flat say it, evil because they think they have power, they think they have a narrative that only belongs to them, and if you're not them, then you're wrong. It's my belief that this country was founded by men that created a constitution that has stood the time, stood the time, test of time for over 200 years. We're in the greatest fight we ever had, bigger than 1776. And in wildlife, where I've spent all my time, 57 some years, I don't want to see that go away. And I'll do whatever I, this man can to inform you, my listeners, that you can make a difference. I can make a difference. Together with Dan, we can make a difference. Because what happens in November at a national level and here in Colorado will define what's going to happen in this country for years to come. Final thoughts, Dan? I would like people, as they're applying for licenses here in a month in the state of Colorado, some of which is already happening in other states where applications are due. Yeah, January already closed. I mean, yep. elk hunting in Wyoming already closed January. Yep. I, I would I would like people to, to take a strong look at why they want to hunt in their home state or why they want to hunt in a foreign state, you know, if you live in Ohio and you want to turn around and go to Colorado, or if you live in Texas and you want to go to Wyoming, or maybe why you want to hunt in Canada, or maybe even a foreign country. Why do you want to do what you do? It's, it's, a, it's an urge. It's primal. It's instinctive. We are hunter-gatherers on the landscape. It's tradition. It's heritage. It's, it's, it's maybe because you have accomplishments that you want to be able to be successful at. Maybe you maybe you have endeavors that you want to you want to see the far east or you want to see the far west or you want to see something that drives you just like it did the people that I previously mentioned that put a lot of this on the landscape for us today. Why are you doing what you do? It's a challenge. It's part of your psyche. It's it's part of your gene pool. It's bred into you. Whatever it might be. Maybe you just found that this was your calling and you have to pursue game in some capacity. And while we might look at it from a, a food source, in all reality, there's a lot of stuff, Bruce, that we don't turn around and have to have to be able to survive on, especially if you're waiting to draw a bighorn <laughs> yeah. sheep after 30 years. You would have starved to death if you waited to eat sheep meat uh, or moose meat or wherever, unless you went to the far north. But people need to, they need to look inside themselves and this is something that they can contribute to and be part of the victory. This is something I really honestly believe that they can have buy-in to, as opposed to saying, well, yep, Colorado screwed, whether you live here or whether you don't. Well, yep, Wyoming screwed. Well, yep, New Mexico screwed. How long down the road do you have before it gets to the point where everything is screwed? We have to figure out a way to say no. I think that the sportsmen and women are at a point where they realize they have to say no. They can't just keep turning a cheek. They can't just say that it's in the neighboring state, that it's a neighboring species problem, a neighboring method of take problem. 
This is a animal rights extremist issue. And they don't care where they go or what they accomplish as long as it's gone. Keep this in mind that when you turn around and put your licenses in, your applications in, no matter where it might be, it's not the fact that you're putting in and you might harvest too many. It's that you harvest any, that you want to harvest any. They take that away. Think about how many resident and non-resident hunters in the state of Colorado are unsuccessful. 91%, according to state statistics, or 91% are unsuccessful. Nine out of 10 pay into the public resource so everybody, whether they hunt or whether they don't, can enjoy that wildlife. 20% of lion hunters in the state of Colorado are successful. 80% are not. Four out of five go buy a license to pursue, if they so choose, a mountain lion, but only 20% are actually successful. Are you that part of that 20%? Are you part of that 9% on elk? Because when you put your license fees in or you put your applications in, you're doing it so you can probably be in the minority of success, not the majority. Your hope is, but it's the opportunity. It's what you get to do out of your life to take your time and your money to put it somewhere else in hopes that you're going to be able to continue to do that if you draw the tag. What I'm asking people, and it's hard for me, Bruce, to sit here and ask for money. What I'm hoping is that people will turn around and say, I put $50 in for a preference point and $300 for a resident license or, or a non-resident license, depending on what you hunt. I'm going to take $50 or a box of ammo or a tank of gas, and I'm going to kick it in to save the hunt Colorado.com while I'm doing all of this other stuff. Because next year, when the, if they lose in Colorado, maybe I don't have the opportunity to do it. And I'll be thinking the next license season when I go to apply, I should have done that then. I should have contributed then because now I don't get a chance. Oh, but look, they're in New Mexico this year. They're in Nevada this year. I don't want for people to turn around and look behind them and regret them not engaging. If we're so foresightful ourselves, like our stewards on the landscape were 125 years ago, if we're so foresightful that we're going to put in license applications in eight different states in hopes that we're going to be able to draw something and we get a bonus point and a preference point and an extra point and then some other different draw, put a little bit of money in to the fight to make sure that we support the North American model of wildlife conservation, and that we can live to fight another day to help the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and the Mule Deer Foundation and the National Wild Turkey Federation and Muley Fanatics and all the other acronym groups that are out there. Help us do this here. Be part of the victory. Be part of a successful team. And then next year when you put your licenses in, you can say, I was part of that. Now New Mexico's got the problem. Now Arizona's got the problem. I can help there too, and it's a winning fight because of what I helped there in Colorado. SaveTheHuntColorado.com. You can continue to get updates. You can go on Instagram at c.r.w.m, and you can also check us out on Facebook at the Coloradans for Responsible Wildlife Management. And, and I tell you, if you look at what we're doing, and I'm not a social media guru, but the stuff that I've done in the last six weeks that people <laughs> have reached out. Yeah. Uh, Jason Matt Singer, Cameron Haynes. Today I did a podcast with Derek Wolf with Wolf Untamed, Randy Newberg, uh, Robbie Kroger, the Howl guys. I mean, Blood Origins, you name it, they're reaching out because they see the need of this. And I just hope that listeners around the country will take this serious enough to say it's not one goofy bearded guy that's turning around and trying to start this deal. This is a movement. It is an organized coalition. They're coming together and they're doing it for the same damn reason. To defeat these measures and make sure that that doesn't go to another state or another species or another method of take. And I already said it, I'll just repeat it. If we don't stop it here in Colorado, it's coming to your state, period. Guaranteed. 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 And with that, if you want to reach out to me, you can reach out to me at hutchonhunting at gmail.com. Hutchonhunting.com is my website. And listen to my podcasts across the world at Hutch on Hunting on every single station that's out there. 
And so all you have to do is throw in Hutch on hunting and you'll get my episodes and, and listen to this. And I'll be having Dan on the show as we uh, move forward to support him because it takes all of us folks and every $5 counts. And I know when I was hunting a lot, how much money I spent. And I wouldn't have had that opportunity to go to the places I've gone without solid management and science to meet the people, to see the sunsets, the sunrises, build community throughout North America. I wouldn't have that. Yeah, I've killed some stuff. Got a couple of deer on the wall. But when I look at those trophies, they're memories. And I could call them memories versus trophies and it wouldn't matter. And so I just hope you take what Dan and I have shared today to heart and think about Save the Hunt, Colorado.com and sending in a couple of bucks. With that, thanks, Dan, for being on the show. And that's a wrap. Bruce, thanks a bunch. Appreciate it a bunch. And uh, stay the course and aim small, miss small. <laughs>